Okay, in the previous video we introduced moral naturalism in general and we examined some of the problems that this approach faces. What I want to do in the next couple of videos is look at some specific naturalist theories. We're going to start with a view known as Cornell realism. Uh, the Cornell realists were a group of philosophers who emerged around the 1980s. They were primarily associated with Cornell University, hence the name Cornell realism. Uh, they wanted to bring the metaphysics and epistemology of morality in line with the metaphysics and epistemology of the sciences. Uh, they argued that moral facts can be investigated and justified using scientific methods. Richard Boyd, David Brink and Nicholas Sturgeon are some of the main fig figures in Cornell realism. Now, in the previous video, I mentioned that there are reductionist and non-reductionist versions of moral naturalism. The Cornell realists are non-reductionist. They hold that we can't reduce moral language to non-moral language and that moral properties are multiply realized by natural properties. One reason for preferring non-reductionism is proposed by Nicholas Sturgeon. This is discussed in Alex Miller's intro to Metaethics. Um, so Sturgeon begins by asking the reductionist, well, what exactly is the naturalistic vocabulary to which moral terms are supposed to be reduced? And it would appear that there are two options. First, we might try reducing moral terms to the language of physics. Now, that seems obviously ill-motivated, right? I mean, we, we don't expect to reduce the language of, say, biology to physics. Um, I mean, we can show that biological properties are constituted by physical properties, but for various reasons, we can't actually describe biological processes in purely physical terms. The world is far too complex for that. Now, moral language is, of course, applied to behavior, which seems to be the domain of biology, psychology, sociology, and so on. So there's no reason to expect the language of physics to be sufficient here, even if moral properties are, like all other natural properties, ultimately physical properties. So the second option then is uh, reducing moral, moral terms to the language of biology, psychology, sociology, and the other softer sciences. Consider, for example, the proposal that goodness just is pleasure. Somebody attracted to straightforward utilitarianism might say this, that the only thing of intrinsic value is pleasure and the only thing of intrinsic disvalue is pain. Now, pleasure is, of course, a psychological term. If goodness just is pleasure, then it looks like we have reduced moral goodness to a, pu to a purely psychological property. Um, and we, we can use purely psychological language to, uh, to, to reduce moral language. Uh, now, that's only moral goodness. Obviously, there are a variety of other moral terms that would remain unreduced, but hopefully that illustrates how reductionism to the language of the softer sciences might proceed. Now, this is more plausible than uh, physical reduction, but the problem, Sturgeon says, is that there's just no good reason to hold morality to this test, because we don't hold other fields of inquiry to such test. Uh, we all accept that we need not reduce psychological language to biological language, or reduce sociological language to psychological language, and so on. Uh, the point is that there are a variety of autonomous fields of empirical inquiry. Psychologists certainly need to consider the insights of biology, but there are various questions, methods, and theories in psychology that are framed in distinctly psychological terms. Uh, the Cornell realists expect that moral inquiry will similarly be distinct and autonomous from other fields. However, as uh, Miller points out, there are important disanalogies between ethics and these other fields. Uh, consider in particular the way that moral facts are intrinsically action guiding. They issue uh, prescriptions for behavior. Uh, consider the way that morality seems to involve irresolvable disagreements to a greater extent at least than these other fields. For these kinds of reasons, we might suspect that for moral naturalism to be successful, we're gonna need some sort of reductionist strategy. I mean, the obvious danger of non-reductionism is that we might slide into non-naturalism, where we're treating moral properties as something entirely different from natural properties, not amenable to scientific investigation. Um, reductionism provides a, a more secure way of making ethics a scientific empirical discipline. So to take the example of goodness and pleasure, well, if goodness just is pleasure, 
uh, obviously it becomes in principle very straightforward to do an empirical investigation into which actions will produce the most uh, goodness. Um, for non-reductionists, it's not so clear how to you know, turn morality into an empirical discipline. Um, so you know, this, is, this is the challenge, right? How can we make sense of the idea that moral properties are natural properties while also saying that moral language is not reducible to non-moral language, while also saying that morality is an autonomous field of inquiry in the same way that psychology seems to be autonomous from biology. Cornell realism uh, provides an answer to this, and the answer involves essentially two parts. First, the Cornell realists have an account of the semantics of moral terms, and second, they have an account of the uh, epistemology of how we come to have moral knowledge. So let's begin with the semantics. Cornell realists endorse an account known as causal regulation semantics. Uh, I should warn you that the literature on this topic is pretty technical. Uh, my presentation is going to be somewhat simplified. Uh, the basic idea is that the semantics of moral terms works in essentially the same way as the semantics of other natural kind terms, such as water, gold and tiger. Um, causal regulation semantics was initially developed for natural kind terms like these uh, and that you know, the basic idea was proposed most famously by Hilary Putnam. So let's take a term which refers to a natural kind, so water let's say. Now on the one hand there are the properties that we standardly associate with water such as being a tasteless transparent liquid with relatively low viscosity, uh, necessary for life, quenches thirst, fills the oceans, sometimes falls from the sky, and so on. Uh, Putnam calls the description of this set of properties the stereotype of the term water. So that, you know, the stereotype of the term water consists of the properties that are just in an everyday way commonly associated with water. On the other hand, there is the hidden chemical structure which typically causes samples of water to have the superficial properties that they do. This of course is H2O, and we take it that you know, the term water refers to H2O. Uh, samples of H2O form the extension of the term water, where the extension of a term consists of the things in the world to which the term refers. Now, on a traditional view of meaning, the meaning of a natural kind term is given by its stereotype, is given by the description of properties commonly associated with the kind. So X is water means something like X is a tasteless transparent liquid with relatively low viscosity and so on and so on. And then the thought is that since it happens that H2O is the thing that has these properties, water therefore refers to H2O. So the, you know, the stereotype fixes the extension because the extension is what satisfies the stereotype. Or in other words, the, it, it's because the stereotype is true of the extension. The problem with this traditional picture is that these properties of the stereotype are actually neither necessary nor sufficient for something to be water. Something can be water without these properties. Um, so consider H2O in all kinds of unusual situations, you know, very high pressure or whatever. Uh, similarly, um, more significantly perhaps, something can have all these properties and not be water. Something can have the Stereo can have all the properties of the stereotype but still not be water. And this is illustrated by Putnam's famous twin earth thought experiment. So imagine a planet, uh, twin earth, that is almost identical to our earth, even down to its history. So you know, right now on twin earth there is a counterpart of you listening to a counterpart of me talk about moral naturalism. You know, the one thing that's different on twin earth is that the stuff that the twin earthers call water and which has all of the same superficial properties as our water, in fact has a completely different molecular structure. Um, call it XYZ. So the tasteless transparent liquid that twin earthers drink, that falls from their sky, that fills their oceans, is not H2O, but XYZ. Now suppose that somebody from our earth were transported to twin earth. This person points to a sample of tasteless transparent liquid um, and, and says, that's water. Has that person spoken truly? Well, according to Putnam, our intuition is that no, they haven't. Because when people from Earth use the term water, they refer to H2O. And since the stuff on Twin Earth is not composed of H2O, 
we don't speak truly in calling it water. When Earthers use the term water, they refer to H2O. When Twin Earthers use the term water, they refer to XYZ. And this is despite the fact that they're using the same word and they associate the same set of properties with that word. Indeed, the internal mental states of the Earthers and the Twin Earthers may be exactly the same. They might have the same internal mental content, but they refer to different things uh, because there's different stuff in the world. So the point then is that the stereotype of the term water does not give the meaning of the term. Rather, it fixes the reference of the term via um, an additional assumption where, uh, so it's x is water if and only if x has the property that is dominantly causally responsible for our perceptions of the properties in the stereotype of water. Um, so properties such as being a tasteless transparent liquid with relatively low viscosity. In the actual world, water refers to H2O because that role is played by H2O, because H2O is that thing that is causally responsible for our perceptions of properties such as filling the oceans, being a tasteless transparent liquid and so on. You know, when I say things like that's a refreshing glass of water, the substance that's actually in the glass is H2O. So H2O is what causally regulates our use of the term water. And in general, then, the idea is that natural kind terms refer to the properties that causally regulate the use of those terms. Now, Richard, uh, Richard Boyd has developed this account by uh, adding the idea that an important aspect of causal regulation is that beliefs about the causal property become more true over time. So I think this is summed up quite nicely by uh, Mark von Rugen in his intro to Metaethics. Von Rugen says that on Boyd's account, and I quote, a term refers to the property that causally explains how beliefs expressed using that term come to be more nearly true over time when construed as picking out that very property. So let's unpack this a bit. We interact with various properties in the world. Sometimes our interaction with a property gives us information about that property, and we can express this information using a term, using a predicate. Now, there are two conditions that will you know, tie a term to a property, that will make the term refer to the property. First, partly as a result of our causal connection to the property, we find out more about the property to which uh, the term is interpreted as referring to. And second, over time, we revise our views about the referent of the term so that they become closer and closer to the truth. And this is exactly what we find with the term water. Water refers to H2O, and it referred to H2O before anybody knew what H2O was, because if we interpret the term water to refer to H2O, then we can see that over time we have increased our proportion of true beliefs about H2O. When people in the past made claims involving the term water, they were in fact interacting with H2O, and their beliefs were in fact mostly true of H2O. And as they investigated the properties of water, it was the properties of H2O in general that they were uncovering. So. That's the idea. Now, the causal, the, the Cornell realist simply extends this uh, account of semantics to moral terms also. So take the phrase morally good. Morally good, on the Cornell realist view, refers to the natural property or properties that causally regulate the beliefs we express using that phrase in such a way that those beliefs become more true over time and an action is morally good just in case it has this natural property. So we have something like, you know, X is good if and only if it possesses the property P uh, with the following causal profile. Uh, the presence of P in a thing typically leads people to pursue that thing. Uh, its presence in a thing typically leads people to encourage others to pursue that thing. And judgments about the presence of P are accorded great importance and so on and so forth. Um, so, I mean, what this captures is that, you know, good, uh, morally good, is a term of commendation. And that's part of the stereotype of the term good. You know, we, we use good to express commendation and praise. But what the term good refers to is the natural property that causally regulates this usage. Now, obviously, 
there is one important difference between the predicate morally good and the predicate water. In the case of water, we have a reductionist account. We have terms in the language of chemistry that pick out the property in question, H2O. Water just is H2O. Cornell realists think you're not gonna get that with goodness, which leads to the question, well, what exactly is goodness then? Like what is the property or set of properties that causally regulates our use of the term good? Obviously this can't be spelled out in reductive terms, at least on the Cornell realist view. Um, so here Boyd appeals to the idea of homeostatic property clusters. A homeostatic property cluster is a set of properties that tend to be commonly instantiated together, either due to having some sort of underlying causal mechanism or due to uh, causal relations between the properties such that any one of the properties will tend to promote the occurrence of the rest. Um, so an example of this would be something like health. Uh, some people are healthy, some people less so. Now health is an objective property, or so some people would say. Uh, it really exists in the world, but it isn't just one thing, and it's not reducible to uh, you know, purely biological terminology, certainly not reducible to purely physical terminology, you know, the language of physics. Um, the term health picks out a somewhat vague cluster of mutually supporting properties. Uh, so a healthy person is a person who is physically fit, well-nourished, active, concerned with their continued existence, socially responsible, and so on. In normal conditions, having any one of these traits tends to promote the occurrence of the others. Being well nourished, for example, will help you remain physically fit, while being physically fit will help you do the things you need to do in order to obtain nourishment. So by having you know, one of these properties, you're promoting, you're promoting the other ones. You have this kind of cluster of mutually supporting properties. And it's, it's somewhat vague. We can't spell it out exactly, but it's, you know, it's a very complex property cluster but it's an objective feature of reality. Some things are healthy, some things less so. Furthermore, health has a genuine causal profile. We can identify things that will improve or impede health. Clean water improves the health of a person, whereas smoking impedes it. We can identify the effects of health. A healthy person will tend to have more energy and will tend to live a longer life, and so on. Now, goodness, is then claimed to be a, a property cluster like this, a complex property cluster like this. Indeed, goodness includes health as one of the properties in its cluster. Um, other properties in the goodness property cluster might include peace, liberty, happiness, economic prosperity, and knowledge. Um, these various property clusters promote the other property clusters, so a peaceful society will tend to promote a healthy population. Um, right? Obviously, people aren't you know, killing each other or constantly stealing from each other. You're going to have a healthier population. Uh, similarly, if people are healthy, they're more likely to be peaceful, right? There are, you know, there are many things that make you less healthy, such as drinking water from lead pipes that will also make you more aggressive, right? As a person's health improves, they tend to become more peaceful. So by promoting one of the properties in the goodness cluster, you promote the others as well. So goodness is, it's something, it's like, you know, well-being or flourishing or something like that. Um, but it's a, a very complex, uh, somewhat, you know, vaguely defined property cluster, which includes the, this wide range of other things. Um, and it should be obvious why this isn't going to be reducible in the way that water is reducible to H2O. You know, goodness is a property cluster. And uh, many of the properties it consists of are themselves also property clusters, are themselves also irreducible. Um, anyway, uh, this is the property cluster that causally regulates our use of the term good. Hence, it's what the term good refers to. It is an objective uh, natural property cluster. It's an objective natural kind. Um, and we can define other moral terms with respect to goodness. So badness is obviously just the opposite of the good. And then we can say that it's morally right to act in such a way as to promote what's good, morally wrong to promote what's bad, and so on. 
Um, and so this is how you can have a non-reductionist form of moral naturalism. Um, goodness is an objective, natural kind, but it isn't reducible. Um, but it has, you know, just like health is something that we can empirically investigate, just like health is irreducible, but it has a robust causal profile so we can empirically investigate it, so it is uh, with goodness, um, according to the Cornell realist. Uh, it has a robust causal profile, we can empirically investigate it, even though it's irreducible. So that's how the Cornell realists treat the semantics of moral terms. Of course, the big question here is, why should we think that there actually is any natural property or property cluster that plays the required role? This brings us to the epistemology of Cornell realism. Uh, remember, Boyd's idea is that the property of moral goodness, the property to which the term morally good refers, is whatever property causally regulates our use of this term. Now, Obviously, the, the story here is only acceptable if there is, in fact, such a property that we can interact with in the right kind of way. Cornell realists, therefore, need to explain how we can develop and justify moral beliefs. And this is where their epistemology comes in. Essentially, the idea is that moral reasoning is based on inference to the best explanation. Inference to the best explanation is of great importance in the empirical sciences. Uh, we can't prove scientific theories deductively. We can never be 100% sure that any given scientific theory is correct. After all, all scientific theories are in principle falsifiable. But we provisionally accept those scientific theories that provide the best explanations for the phenomena. The origin of species through evolution by natural selection from a universal common ancestor is the best explanation for the various patterns we observe in the biosphere. We can't actually replay the tape of history and see how life really developed so of course it's logically possible that we're wrong maybe god made the world six thousand years ago and planted fossils in order to test our faith but modern evolutionary theory provides a much more powerful explanation uh, similarly we can't actually see things on the quantum scale and observe protons directly, but we can be confident that there are protons because these are postulated by physical theories that provide uh, powerful explanations of the phenomena. In inference to the best explanation, we consider a range of explanations, we look at how they perform in terms of various theoretical virtues, such as uh, predictive accuracy, simplicity, explanatory scope, uh, fruitfulness for further research, and so on. And the explanation that is taken to score highest on the widest range of these theoretical virtues is inferred to be true. Uh, in the view of many philosophers, this is one of the primary methods of the sciences. According to the Cornell realists, moral theorizing works in pretty much the same way. We arrive at the moral truths by applying inference to the best explanation. And as we learn more about the world and engage in reasoning about moral principles, our moral theories will become increasingly close to the truth, in the same way as many people think scientific theories become increasingly close to the truth. So in general, those who accept inference the best explanation tend to say that we are justified in believing in some property just in case that property plays an important role in our best explanatory theories of how the world works. The Cornell realist adds, that moral properties have explanatory power. Uh, moral properties are indispensable features of our best theories of the world. So we can be confident that there are moral properties. For pretty much the same reason, we can be confident that there are protons and neutrons and black holes. And you know, for pretty much the same reason, we can be confident that species evolved by natural selection and so on. Um, so we can sum up the argument like so, uh, we're justified in believing in some property when that property figures indispensably in our best explanations of the phenomena. Moral properties figure indispensably in our best explanations of the phenomena, so we're justified in believing that moral properties are real. The obvious question here is, well, why should we think that moral properties play a role in the best explanations of phenomena? Um, this seems like a slightly odd way of thinking about morality, right? I mean, it's certainly, you know, do, do we often appeal to moral properties in explanations. I mean, at least initially, it doesn't seem like morality is uh, much of an empirical field. It doesn't seem like there's much of an analogy between morality and the sciences. Well, a couple of examples here are provided by 
Nicholas Sturgeon. So first, one kind of explanation, one kind of moral explanation appeals to moral character. Let's say that a group of youths dows a cat in petrol and set it on fire. You observe this and you come to form the judgment that they are morally depraved. Now Sturgeon's idea is that the fact that the youths are morally depraved partly explains why they tortured the cat, and furthermore, the fact that they tortured the cat partly explains why you judge them to be morally depraved. So the fact that they're morally depraved plays a role in the explanation of why you form the judgment that they're morally depraved. We can also cite various facts to explain why they became morally depraved, you know, facts about their, their upbringing, for example. So this is a case where moral character has causes, such as their upbringing, and effects, such as their behaviour and the judgments it induces in others. And um, yeah, the fact that, that moral character has this causal profile is what allows it to be cited in explanations. Second, there are explanations that appeal to the moral features of actions or institutions. Sturgeon gives the example of slavery. Widespread opposition to slavery arose in the 18th and 19th centuries, primarily in Britain, France and North America. Why was this? Slavery was an old institution, it existed throughout the New World, so we need an explanation for why the opposition to slavery arose in, in the specific time and place that it did. Now part of the answer, Sturgeon suggests, is that the chattel slavery in Britain, French America, later the United States, was morally worse than previous forms of slavery. It was a more violent and oppressive institution. So the moral badness of slavery partly explains the growth of anti-slavery sentiments. Now, of course, in order to make moral observations, as it were, we are presupposing some background moral theory, right? We don't simply see the wrongness in somebody being enslaved. Rather, we judge these actions to be wrong partly on the basis of some moral theory that we accept, a theory that tells us that we ought not to act cruelly, we ought not to discriminate against others on the basis of their ancestry, and so on. The Cornell realist will point out, however, that exactly the same is true for scientific observations. All interaction with the world is mediated by theory. Suppose I look through a microscope at some pond life. If I have no concept of bacteria or cells or you know, size or whatever, if I have no understanding of the construction of the microscope, then I will have no idea what I'm seeing. I'll just see some indeterminate colours and shapes. Um, and this doesn't mean that biology is unscientific, it's just that in order for anybody to gather any information about the world from observation, we need to make some assumptions about how the world is structured and how that structure relates to what is experienced. So the Cornell realist will grant that somebody who has a defective moral theory might well judge slavery to be good, and so they won't be able to appeal to this explanation that uses the moral badness of slavery. Um, similarly, somebody who has no moral theory will be unable to make any moral judgments at all. But similarly, somebody who has a defective biological theory will make the wrong judgment about what they're viewing through a microscope, for example. Um, so you know, the fact that our moral judgments, our moral observations are dependent on background theory, background moral theory, um, does, does not in any way uh, impugn moral explanations, according to the Cornell realist. So that is the basic idea. Now, this account of moral explanation is extremely controversial, unsurprisingly, and a major challenge to, to this kind of reasoning is raised by uh, Gilbert Harmon's explanatory impotence argument. Uh, Alex Miller in his intro to Metaethics has a useful summary of this debate, um, but I'll, I'll go through it uh, a little bit. Um, there's much more detail available in that book. Um, so we actually already encountered this argument, I think, in the videos on moral non-naturalism, but um, just in case you don't remember it, I'll, I'll just review it. So again, let's take the case of the youths setting the cat on fire. Um, again, an observer sees this and forms the belief that what these youths are doing is morally wrong. Now, Harmon says, look, the thing is, we don't need to cite the wrongness of the action as part of an explanation for why the observer formed this belief. We can explain the formation of this belief by appealing to two things, broadly speaking. First, the straightforward 
physical facts, such as the holding of a lighter to the cat's fur, plus the physical mechanism by which this information reached the observer's brain, you know, involving light rays and the retina and the optic nerve and so on, right? So you've got the, the kind of mechanical facts on the one hand. And second, there's the psychological facts about the observer making the judgment. There's what we might call the observer's sensibility. Basically, the facts about the action, plus the fact that the observer has a particular emotional sensibility, are sufficient to explain why the observer formed the belief that the action was wrong. It looks like this kind of non-moral explanation will always be available to oppose any explanation that appeals to moral properties. I mean, it's pretty straightforward to see how you can apply the same kind of explanation to the slavery case um, or to many other cases uh, where, where we might appeal to moral properties. Now contrast this with the case of entities postulated by successful scientific theories. The physicist sees a vapour trail in a cloud chamber and says, that's an electron. Well, the best explanation for why the physicist formed this belief, and indeed the best explanation for a host of other facts as well, is that there really is an electron in the cloud chamber. Physical theory tells us the causal mechanism by which the electron produced the vapour trail. The electron is a charged particle, and as it goes through the cloud chamber, it ionises molecules in the cloud chamber, and then other molecules condense around these ionised molecules, and this appears as a vapour trail. If we try to eliminate electrons from our ontology, we can't give this explanation, so we suffer an explanatory loss. But there's no explanatory loss from the elimination of moral properties from our ontology, uh, or so Harman's argument goes. Basically, the assumption underlying Harman's argument is that if you can explain all of the phenomena perfectly adequately without postulating moral properties, then there's just no good reason to believe that there are any moral properties. The Cornell realists agree with this assumption, but they, they disagree that moral properties are explanatorily impotent. They think that moral properties do have explanatory relevance. So you know, the, the question here then is how do we evaluate um, claims of explanatory relevance? Well, Miller uh, suggests that one way to judge explanatory relevance is to apply a counterfactual test. So, X as being F is explanatorily relevant to Y's being G, just in case, had X not been F, then Y would not have been G. So, striking the match is explanatorily relevant to the explosion, right? It's so striking the match partly explains why the explosion happened because had the match not been struck, the gas would not have exploded. Um, now Harman's thought seems to be this. Even if torturing the cat had not been morally wrong, the observer would still have judged it to be morally wrong because what caused that judgment is the observer's sensibility. So the purported moral properties make no difference to the observer's belief about the moral properties. Similarly, had the institution of slavery not been morally wrong, people would still have judged it to be morally wrong, because what's driving the moral judgments uh, are, the, are the sensibilities of the observers. Now the trouble with all this is that from the perspective of the Cornell realists, there is actually a very obvious problem with this line of argument. One of the basic ideas of Cornell realism is that uh, acts which possess certain non-moral properties, such as the property of pointless deliberate cruelty, thereby possess the moral property of wrongness. So pointless deliberate cruelty is one of the properties that realises the moral property of wrongness. It's one of the set of properties to which the term wrong refers. Um, you know, moral properties are natural properties and po pointless cruelty is just one of the natural properties that realises the property of wrongness. So if this is correct, then in order for an action not to be wrong, it must also lack the property of pointless deliberate cruelty. If you apply this to the cat example, right, well, what makes the action wrong is that it's an action of pointless deliberate cruelty. Uh, in order for torturing the cat to lack the property of wrongness, it must also lack the property of pointless deliberate cruelty. So now if we consider the counterfactual, right? Consider this counterfactual. If torturing the cat had lacked the property of pointless deliberate cruelty, then we would still have judged it to be wrong. 
Well, that doesn't seem to be obviously true anymore. I mean, it's not in entirely clear what scenario we're even supposed to be imagining here. I guess we could consider some weird hypothetical where somebody tortures a cat, but they do this not because they enjoy suffering, but in order to, you know, defuse a bomb or something. I mean, maybe there's some bomb that's set up in such a way that you have to torture a cat to defuse it or something like that. Well, in that case, our judgment about their moral character will be different. Um, so, you know, the key point for the Cornell realists is moral properties are constituted by non-moral properties. So in order to change the moral properties of an action, you necessarily change the non-moral properties of the action. And in that case, the counterfactual, which supports the, the judgment of explanatory irrelevance, you know, the, 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 the claim that had the moral properties been different, the observer's judgment would have been the same. Well, that counterfactual is no longer true. Uh, if you change the non-moral properties of an action, then people's judgment about the moral status of the action will change. So, you know, it would appear that Harmon's argument, even if it's successful against the moral non-naturalist, has much less force against the naturalist. Uh, from the naturalist point of view, the wrongness of an action does make a difference, counterfactually. Now, um, one response to all this, uh, Harmon's response, is that counterfactual dependence is, is actually not enough to establish explanatory relevance. It's not enough to say, well, if the action hadn't been wrong, then the observer would not have judged it to be wrong. Essentially, Harmon says we also need an account of the mechanisms or processes that underlie this dependence. We need a theoretical account which you know, ties the wrongness of the action to the observer's disapproval of it. After all, when a scientific theory postulates an unobservable entity like an electron, it, it doesn't simply claim counterfactual dependence, right? It doesn't, it doesn't just say, well, if there hadn't been an electron, there wouldn't have been a vapor trail in the cloud chamber. Um, it specifies the mechanism by which the electron causes the vapor trail. And this mechanism is what's missing in moral explanation. Um, and and you know, the fact that physical theory specifies this mechanism is what makes it the case that you will suffer an explanatory loss if you try to eliminate the entity, right? No, eliminate the electron from your ontology and you no longer have that mechanism for producing the vapor trail. Um, but, you know, we don't seem to have causal mechanisms in moral explanations. That seems to be missing. Um, now, I mean, one move we might make in response to this is to say, well, not all explanation needs to cite causes. Uh, so, for example, if a mathematical Platonist wants to explain why somebody believes that 2 plus 2 equals 4, she will not suppose that the mathematical facts cause the belief because mathematical objects are abstract and have no causal powers. Um, I mean, the, the, the problem with this kind of move in this context is that Cornell realists explicitly conceive of moral properties as being natural properties with causal powers. Um, you know, if if moral properties are not causal, then you can't get causal regulation semantics to work, obviously, right? Like the causal regulation semantics requires moral properties to be causal, to be causal properties. Um, so, you know, while it's true that some explanations can be non-causal um, and, and, and therefore don't need to cite causal mechanisms, it, it does seem like the Cornell realist is gonna require causal explanations. There are some further problems here for the Cornell realist. Answering Harmon's challenge does not in itself vindicate moral realism. It shows that moral properties might in principle figure in our best explanations. But to get to moral realism, we also need to show that such explanations do in fact exhibit the appropriate theoretical virtues. We need to show that they are in fact the best explanations. And <clears throat> the moral anti-realist can object here. Take the example of the hoodlums torturing the cat. Does it really explain anything to say that these hoodlums are morally depraved? Somebody asks us, why did those people torture the cat? And we reply, well, because they are morally depraved. Well, that seems a fairly trivial answer. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty crap explanation. It doesn't really tell us anything useful. Um, so, we hold explanations in science to fairly high standards. Uh, what is required before we are willing to postulate the existence of some theoretical entity like an electron? Well, it isn't simply a matter of it being part of 
a good explanation, or, or actually it's not necessarily even a matter of it being the best explanation. Um, you might want to check out my series on scientific realism if you're interested in this, um, but explanations in order to be acceptable have to exhibit a number of theoretical virtues, let's say. Um, at least within science, scientific theories are accepted only, only when they exhibit a number of different theoretical virtues. Even the best explanation, if it doesn't exhibit sufficient theoretical virtues, we will not infer it to be true. So, for one thing, scientific theories make uh, correct novel predictions. Uh, that is, predictions of phenomena that are surprising and unexpected. Uh, consider, for example, general relativity's correct prediction of the values of light bending around the sun and the values for the gravitational redshift of light. These were completely unexpected predictions, it got them right. Um, it made these predictions before the uh, observations were known, um, and they were surprising facts when they were confirmed. Now many philosophers think that the best case for believing in theoretical entities occurs when those entities are postulated in theories that make correct novel predictions. Um, again, you can, like I say, check out my series on scientific realism if you're interested in more on this. Um, but, you know, moral theories don't seem to make any novel predictions. Um, I mean, certainly not any, like, precise novel predictions in the way that uh, theories like general relativity do. Um, I mean, I, I guess you can use moral theories to make predictions about people's behaviour. Um, like, if I think that somebody is morally depraved, then, yeah, maybe I'll predict that they will take pleasure in witnessing suffering or something like that. But, yeah, that's not really a novel prediction, right? Um, and, it, and it looks like you don't really need a moral theory to make that prediction. You could, you could make the same prediction using just, like, non-moral psychological theory. Um, so moral theories don't seem to allow us to make any predictions beyond what we can make with just everyday non-moral theories. And certainly they don't seem to make any novel predictions. Um, another theoretical virtue is simplicity. We prefer theories that make fewer assumptions, that invoke fewer types of entities. Now notice that if we postulate moral properties, suddenly we face this whole raft of questions that have no straightforward answer. Questions like, well, which entities are the ones that are granted moral value? How and why? Like, you know, why does something come to have you know, moral value. Why is it something? Why does something come to be worthy of moral consideration? How do we weigh competing moral claims? You know, um, like clashes of rights and so on. How how do we weigh? You know, whose rights win out over whose? Um, under what circumstances is a person morally responsible for their actions? You know, when can we blame or praise a person morally, etc. There's a whole host of questions here. Basically, an explanation of events that appeals to morality seems to reduce the overall simplicity of our worldview because <clears throat> because in order to make any moral judgments at all we have to make a host of questionable assumptions in answer to all of these questions right and, and just consider how radically different are all of the normative theories available you know utilitarianism virtue theory deontology contractarianism egoism you know um, and Consider that philosophers are nowhere near a consensus on which one is correct. Um, so there's there's a huge range of different questions about which there's a huge amount of debate. This does not seem like a particularly uh, simple right theory. Right, once we start invoking moral properties, there's a great deal of complexity and um, disagreement and so on. Another important theoretical virtue is unification or consilience. We value those theories that bring together a wide range of seemingly disparate facts that unify them under a single explanatory scheme. Uh, consider how Newtonian mechanics applies to both the orbits of the planets and the swing of a pendulum, or how you know, Maxwell unified electricity and magnetism. Again, moral theories just don't seem to provide much theoretical unification. Uh, they focus on particular classes of behaviour. Um, that's about it. So on this point, um, Miller, uh, again in the intro to Metaethics, quotes Crispin Wright concerning the wetness of rocks. Um, Wright points out that referring to the wetness of rocks can explain four kinds of thing. There are cognitive effects, such as my perceiving and hence believing that the rocks are wet. There are 
uh, what he calls precognitive sensuous effects, such as a small child's interest in his hands after he has touched the rocks. There are effects on us as interactive agents, such as a person slipping and falling while walking on the rocks. And finally, there are the brute physical effects on organisms and inanimate matter, such as the abundance of lichens, lichens growing on the rocks. So, when we appeal to the wetness of rocks, we have a wide range of different things that we can explain. And of course, the wetness of rocks isn't, you know, that's not even a scientific explanation, but it's still uh, a pretty good explanation for things. Um, or at least it's a pretty good explanation for a wide range of some things. Um, now, consider, on the other hand, moral properties. Citing the wrongness of an action can feature in the explanation of cognitive effects, such as a person's moral disapproval and the further effects that this disapproval causes. The fact that torturing the cat is wrong explains why Frank disapproves of torturing the cat. But this moral property doesn't seem to play any role in the direct explanation of what Wright calls the sensuous, interactive and brute effects. So, you know, the point of all of this then is that moral explanations don't seem to be very good explanations. Um, given the criteria that's used in inference to the best explanation, you know, moral explanations don't exhibit the kind of virtues that would justify believing in the entities postulated in an explanation. At least that's that's the concern here. Um, that you know, e even if we accept the causal regulation semantics, we can't we can't justify the existence of moral properties via inference to the best explanation. There's no reason to think then that there there is actually this this kind of complex property of the sort that uh, causal regulation semantics requires. So anyway, that's a a brief taste of the debate around. Uh, Cornell realist epistemology. Um, you know, I, I do want to be clear, the literature on this is pretty enormous. This is only a brief introduction. Um, so before I end, uh, I want to briefly discuss one of the major objections to Cornell realism, and this is the moral twin earth argument, which is proposed by Terence Horgan and Mark Timmons. So recall that the Cornell realists endorse causal regulation semantics which treats moral terms as natural kind terms. Now, we've seen Putnam's Twin Earth Thought Experiment, a planet identical to ours except the stuff to which Twin Earthers apply the word water is composed of H2O. Putnam's intuition was that when us Earthers use the word water, we refer to H2O, whereas when Twin Earthers use the word water, they refer to XYZ. The terms have the same stereotypes, but different extensions. Um, so really, you know, Earthers and Twin Earthers, when we talk about water, we're just talking past each other. Um, yeah, we, we can't really like disagree about water because we're referring to different things. Now, imagine another world, moral twin earth. Moral twin earth is just like earth, except that their moral language is causally regulated by different properties to our moral language. Maybe the intuitive way to think about this is that the twin earthers accept a radically different normative theory. So perhaps, for example, our uses of moral terms like good and right are causally regulated by certain functional properties whose role is captured by some consequentialist theory, say utilitarianism. On the other hand, when twin earthers use good and right, those terms are causally regulated by different functional properties, properties that might be captured by a non-consequentialist theory, um, you know, like deontology. The result of this is that moral twin earthers behave quite differently to us and they tend to praise and blame very different things to us you know they they uh, they have they express commendation and disapproval of different kinds of behavior to us so imagine that an earther visits moral twin earth and they disagree about the application of some moral term the earther says euthanasia is good whereas the twin earther says euthanasia is not good well if we buy causal regulation semantics if we think that good refers to the property that causally regulates uh, the use of that term in the community, then it would appear that the earther and the twin earther have no real disagreement. They're just using words with different definitions. I mean, this is what we would say about the case of uh, natural kind terms like, you know, water, recall. Right? Since the word is causally regulated by a different property on earth and twin earth, it refers to different things. 
um, the, the, the words have, have different meanings. But the argument goes that in, in the moral case, this just doesn't seem right. This doesn't seem like the right account of moral language. Rather, our intuition is that the earther and the moral twin earther have a substantive moral disagreement. Um, indeed, we may well think it would be worthwhile for them to debate the issue. So where the earthers and the moral twin earthers differ is in their moral beliefs, the moral theories that they adopt. They don't differ in the meanings of their terms. So to, to put this more technically then, re remember that the, the idea of causal regulation semantics is that the stereotype fixes the extension of a term as follows. So in the case of water, we have x is water if and only if x has the property that is dominantly causally responsible for our perceptions of the properties in the stereotype of water. So you know, liquidity, uh, quenches thirst, transparent, relatively low viscosity. You know, x is water if it's made of the stuff that's causally responsible for the properties uh, set out in the stereotype of the term water. Okay then, so now let's consider the term good on earth and moral twin earth. Well, on earth, we have something like this, you know, x is good if and only if x possesses the property p with the following causal profile. And we expressed this earlier, so you know, I'm not going to say all of that again. But now for the moral twin earthers, again, x is good if and only if x possesses the property q with the following causal profile. Um, and I mean, the causal profile is like basically the same in each case. Um, yeah, we so the presence of P in a thing typically leads earthers to pursue that thing. The presence of Q in a thing typically leads moral twin earthers to pursue that thing. So it's sort of functionally the same. Um, but if the earthers and the twin earthers have sufficiently different moral attitudes, then it looks like different properties causally regulate their moral terminology, right? You know, if they, if they differ enough in their attitudes, then different properties will causally regulate their moral terms. And in that case, well, the, the moral twin earthers actually don't really have any moral beliefs at all. They don't use moral terms at all. When a twin earther says good, they're not actually picking out moral goodness. Just as when they say water, they're not picking out water. You know, they're not picking out water as in H2O. They simply have no way to refer to goodness or to H2O. And this makes moral disagreement impossible. And that just seems... That just seems like the wrong account of moral language. Now, it's worth noting that arguably, we don't really even need a thought experiment to make this point. Uh, it seems plausible that on the causal regulation view, different societies on this very planet are referring to different properties when they use moral terms. So compare the views of modern liberal societies with those of Islamic theocracies. Um, these are societies that will uh, approve and disapprove of very different types of behaviour for very different reasons. So you know, what reason is there to think that there is some single property or you know cluster property that causally regulates the use of moral terms in both societies? Um, you know, but but when somebody in a liberal society uses the term good, and when somebody in an Islamic society uses the term good we don't take them to be using words with totally different meanings. I mean, it's not like when one person talks about a bank as in a financial institution and another person talks about a bank as in a, ri a river bank. You know, it's not just an equivocation. Um, that, that We would say instead that the liberal and the Islamist simply have a substantive moral disagreement. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the general problem here is that of specifying which... Uh, natural properties are the moral properties. Um, now, on a reductionist approach, the naturalist can, you know, just appeal to like the synonymy of terms. So then the naturalist will say, the reductionist naturalist will say, well, you know, the term good is synonymous with some term for a natural property, and we can learn this via a priori conceptual analysis or something, you know. Cornell realists reject this. They want an empirical approach. So they say the moral facts are those natural facts that causally regulate our use of moral terms um, in the same way that the water facts are the natural facts that causally regulate our use of water terms. And I mean, it's for that reason that we can reduce water to H2O because it turns out that things composed of H2O are what actually play that causal regulatory role. Anyway, 
this, this view is what allows us to do empirical investigation to determine which facts are the moral facts. We just have to figure out which properties in the world causally regulate our moral terms. And that's a question for the empirical sciences. One of the worries of the moral twin earth example is that, I mean, what, what this seems to illustrate is that nothing can play this causal role, given the way that moral discourse actually functions. Um, okay, well, that was Cornell realism. Um, certainly the most influential version of non-reductionist moral naturalism. Um, in the next video, we'll look at reductionist naturalism, but that is all for today. So thanks for watching. Goodbye.